Hi, this is Di, the bass playing mom, and today I'm going to review a movie about music, School of Rock. School of Rock is a 2003 movie, so it's about 15, 16 years out of date. So we're going to see a little technology changes here and there, but really not a lot. It's pretty impressive how they did keep it kind of timeless. The movie is 16 years old. There will be spoilers. If you haven't seen School of Rock, go put a DVD in. I will have a link below to the DVD. Or, of course, it is available to stream. We're going to talk about different parts of this movie. I'm going to let you know, as a musician, did they get it dead on or did they get it dead wrong? You can also give me your feedback in the comments. I would love to hear them. The first section of the movie is the setup. And the setup starts in a venue. We are coming in through the titles and they're showing you the venue. And <laughs> I think they got it dead on. The place looks scuzzy and dirty. There's posters and stickers everywhere. They're stamping people's hands. It looks like a lot of coats of black paint have been used there. The bar looks crummy. And there's a few people standing up listening to the band. Everybody else is kind of complaining that it's so loud because <laughs> they're trying to talk. This is the first time we see Jack Black's character, Dewey, on stage. He's with the band that he helped found, according to the story of the movie, called No Vacancy. And the lead singer for No Vacancy, actually a Broadway actor who starred in Rent, oh, Adam Pascal, and the bass player, a gentleman named Lucas, who's actually a guitar player, which a lot of bass players are actually guitar players. So that's probably dead on. In the opening sequence, we see Jack Black's character, Dewey, freaking out that he can't hear, and he's like turning up his amp. I would expect him to point at his wedge, but he's not pointing at his monitor at all, which that's what I would expect. You can tell he's looking off stage, so he's looking at the monitor tack, and he's saying he can't hear. I, I would just expect that he would be pointing at the floor. We can't see too much gear. The actor, Lucas, who played the bass player, he is playing a Fender Precision or a jazz bass. You let me know what you think down below. He is playing with a pick, this really loud rock song, a song called Fight. So I expect that a bass player might use a pick on a tune like this. It's pretty fast. And so that part's pretty good, and I would say that sounds about right. Jack Black's character does a stage dive off of the stage into the audience and falls on the floor, which in a venue that size would be perfectly reasonable. I don't know. Um, I'm from the Seattle area, so stage diving is and moshing are permitted at most venues. I don't know if that's the same all over the United States, but this is set in New York, so I would think there would be stage diving, but probably not a really big guy into a really small crowd. The next sequence is when we learn that Dewey is behind on his rent and he hasn't paid his friend Ned Schneebly or his friend's girlfriend who's paid by Sarah Silverman who is super annoying and I think that they're really playing off of that kind of Yoko Ono story that you have this girlfriend that's breaking up the band. We later find out that both Ned and Dewey had a band. They were in Megadeth and so <laughs> there's a little play on Megadeth. We can see where there's that girl coming in and breaking up the bandmates that are sharing a place. I would say that that's a stereotypical story, but I'm also gonna say that that one is uh, dead on because there have been a lot of girlfriends, not just Yoko Ono, who messed things up for guys that had a free ride in a band. We learned that Dewey is also a full-time musician, that he doesn't have a day job. And I'm thinking that probably not realistic in 2003 and certainly not realistic in 2019. I have a handful of friends that are full-time musicians who don't have a day job, but they are gigging every single night. And we don't get that kind of feeling from Dewey. There are Indiegogo campaigns now. Bands can do things independently in 2003 without a record deal. That would have been really rough. I would say probably wrong. He probably wouldn't be a full-time musician. Dewey shows up to band rehearsal. He's the last one to arrive. The band is already warming up. And they have already replaced him by a guitar player named Spider. Dewey's argument is they can't kick him out of the band because he was the founder of the band. I've heard way too many of these stories. I have known guys who founded bands and got kicked out of them. I can think of three right off the top of my head in my close friends. So I would say that's pretty much dead on. It's not impossible to get kicked out of a band you started. I would venture to say that's something that happens every day. So 
I'm going to go with that's probably true. We're going to move into the second part of the movie. And the second part of the movie is where we see Dewey impersonate Ned Schneebly to get a job at a private school. And that's where we first see the kids. The kids are between the ages of 9 and 11. They use fifth graders in the movie. They auditioned about 10,000 kids to be in this movie and then went through the last 250 with a fine-tooth comb to pick the kids that were in the movie. Not very realistic that a bunch of fifth graders could form a well-oiled rock band, but this is part of it being a movie, and so I'll give them that. In the school sequence, Jack Black's character says that MTV ruined rock and roll. I'm not sure what you guys think. Do you think MTV ruined rock and roll? I would say that... Rock and Roll had its own problems well before MTV, but you can let me know what you think. We find out that Jack Black's character has all of his gear in a van and nothing's in cases. Having the van, that is true to form. You've got to have a van if you have a van. It's how you're going to haul your gear. Like, there's no getting around having a van. But I think keeping all of your gear in it, especially in New York City or a metropolitan area like Seattle where I am, is just bad form. Like, you're just asking for trouble. I think it was pretty recently that a flock of seagulls had all their gear in a trailer while they were in the hotel and the entire trailer got lifted off and taken. So you've really got to watch your gear. Like if I travel with gear, I will actually try to unload it and bring it into the hotel with me because I just don't feel safe leaving it in a parking lot. And so having all this gear, not even in cases, just sitting in this beat up ugly van with stickers on it, and drawings on the side, I don't think that is very realistic. It did help move the story along because all of a sudden he had all the instruments and the gear for the kids. One thing that's unique about this movie is you actually get to see how a band is put together, how musicians are taught, and then how they work out a song. You don't see that a lot in movies, and so the fact that they try to do that is really interesting. We see the kids in the band room, and they are rehearsing, and you can see that obviously... The character Lawrence is a skilled classic piano player, and the character Joey is a classically trained guitarist. We see that the, there are musicians in the group. When he gets back in the classroom, of course, he's giving them all these instruments and having them play. I think it's great that he gives the character of Joey an electric guitar, and they do, um, let's see, what songs do they work on? They do Iron Man, Smoke on the Water, and Highway to Hell, which are just great guitar riffs and great beginner guitar riffs. In reality, the actor that played Joey, a far better electric guitar player than Jack Black, and so he was actually teaching Jack Black the riffs, which is great, I think. We see the character Katie, uh, played by Rebecca Brown. We see her get her first bass. I think it's a Framus star from a star? Anyway, it's like the kind of bass that, the, that Bill Wyman in the Rolling Stones plays with. See that kind of style of um, hollow body bass, bass that she's playing. The bass is so big on her. Like, I think that I look ridiculously small holding a bass, and this is a short scale bass, but she's playing a full scale bass, and she's just this little girl, you know, in the ninth, not even in the ninth grade, in the fifth grade, and the bass just looks humongous on her. There is a line that everybody knows. They say, oh, you already play cello. If you play bass, it's just the same thing. You know, turn it on its side and cello, which is ridiculous. Bass and cello are totally different. However, I would like to point out that YouTuber Rick Beato, on his channel, he started as a cello player, became a bass player, and then learned all the rock band instruments. So it can be done. It's not really real, but I like that he doesn't have to teach her any fingering technique whatsoever. She doesn't need any help with that. And you can see as a player that she kind of struggles. Her hand does what my hand does, which is it kind of bumbles up. It's not completely ergonomic on the way that it heat, it touches the frets. You know, that's just an area that I could stand to improve on and she probably could too. He tells the drummer, the character Freddie, to play lightly. Good luck with that. I would say it is not realistic that any drummer is going to play lightly. He does make the students all take a vow that they will not fight for the creative control of the band, which is so awesome. How many bands have broken up 
over the fight for creative control. I think that's just a perfect thing to work into there because that is part of the politics of being in a band. He asks the kids who their influences are. They cite Christina Aguilera, Puff Daddy, and Liza Minnelli. Now, there are benefits to all of those people, but they are not the kind of music that Jack Black's character listens to. He cites Led Zeppelin, Sabbath, ACDC, Motorhead, and he says, what do they teach in this place? I remember I wanted my son to do something, and so I and he had got a turntable, so I bought him a Led Zeppelin album and told him if he did it, he got the album. <laughs> It was $2, but it was enough to motivate him. And that's how you get a kid to listen to Led Zeppelin. There's a part where he distributes CDs to the kids that he wants them to learn from the musicians on the CDs. He gives 2112 to the character Freddy, the drummer, which I thought was great. He wants them to listen to Neil Peart. More power to him. And singer Tamika, he gives her uh, Pink Floyd, The Dark Side of the Moon, and tells her to listen to the backing vocals on Great Gig in the Sky. That, perfect. Those are perfect recommendations. I love the CDs that he gives out and that that's completely realistic and those are actually decent recommendations. They're, they go into a montage where they show a lot of different musicians and I think they were all really strong, really, really strong recommendations, which isn't what you expect in a movie always. So that was pretty cool. <laughs> okay, there's a little bit of dialogue that I just had to tell you. The kids are talking quietly, but Katie, who's really Rebecca Brown, but Katie, the bass player, and the drummer Freddie are talking in the hallway, and he says, name two good female drummers, and she says, Sheila E. and Meg White, and he says, Meg White's not a good drummer, and Katie says, she keeps time better than you, which I thought was awesome. There's no point in this movie where the drummer is taught tempo. There's never a click. There's never a metronome, and I would say those would be vital, vital things if you're learning in a band. Okay, now this I would call the performance section of the movie. It starts out with the band's audition, which ends up being a failed audition because they don't get there soon enough before the bill is full. They are going to try to compete in a battle of the bands, and Jack Black's character has talked about he's going to make money by winning a battle of the bands, my experience with Battle of the Bands is that each band puts in a certain amount of money and then uh, the band that wins gets a, get prize money. I think it's a total ripoff. Do you have a different experience? Maybe my experience is wrong. I've seen Battle of the Bands be done for charity. That's a great way. But with the prize money and stuff, I just that's not something you can bet on. I don't think so. And the day of the contest, we hear No Vacancy playing. And they are doing a song called Heal Me, I'm Heart Sick. And it's actually a really good tune. It is a really cool song that they use for that band to be performing. And we get to see our friend Lucas again playing bass. He has like an Ampeg 6x10 or 8x10 uh, cabinet, but I cannot see his head. So if anybody watches this movie and can tell me what the head is of the amplifier that... Lucas, the bass player in No Vacancy, uses. That would be awesome. Oh, that's when the kids finally perform their song. We get to see the song that was supposedly Joey's song. Yeah, originally in the plan for the movie, Jack Black was going to write all the music, but he got quickly, quickly overwhelmed and wasn't able to write all the music. And so they ended up bringing in some other writers. Um, the songs were all helped by Mike White, who plays Ned Schneebly. He was actually the writer on the movie, but he wrote the part for Jack Black, and so he also wrote parts of the songs. And then on that last song, on Joey's song, um, that people popularly call it uh, Teacher's Pet, the theme song for the movie, they brought in the band Mooney Suzuki, and Mooney Suzuki actually worked on it. And they can be seen behind the stage. They're one of the bands that's in the contest of so they got a little part, but Muni Suzuki helped work out the music for this final number.
if you want to be a teacher's pet. Anyway, it's catchy, very corporate, but hey, they got a song with a big finish and the kids do this great job on it and then they lose the contest. Prize goes to no vacancy, which is only fair. They're a legit, straight up good band, but the kids get called out. They hear chanting and they say, what is that? And someone says, that is an encore. So <laughs> the kids get to go out and do an encore. So what really happens though, is we cut away and the kids play uh, ACDC. They play It's a Long Way to the Top If You Wanna Rock and Roll, which is a great song to jam on. It turns out that it was actually like the jam track that the kids were rehearsing to in real life, not recorded in a studio. It's, it's recorded acoustically. And so you can actually hear what it sounds like when the kids are playing, which is really cool. And one of the little girls breaks the fourth wall. She says, now the movie's over and the credits are on the screen. So, she totally breaks the fourth wall. It's really sweet. And we find out that's a song that the kids actually rehearsed on. A little thing after the movie is that they did have a reunion. That's something that I will link in the description. You can see the kids uh, 15 years later get together with Jack Black and have a jam session on that song. Sponsored by Gibson. So a lot of Gibson guitars in that, but you know, it happens. Let me know, what did you think about the movie? My feedback, what is my review? I think that it catches a lot of things that haven't really been captured in popular movies about being a musician. And so I give them credit for that. Do they take some liberties to make it about kids? Yes, is it completely unrealistic? Absolutely, but they really stuck with it and didn't go into Nickelodeon territory or Disney territory. I credit them for that. I think that venue, those venues were all dead on. And so I have enjoyed that movie. I've watched it so many times, I can't even count. I would say that it is a great movie and that it's something the whole family can enjoy, but that as a musician, you can take away some things from it because they did get some of the stuff dead on. What do you think? please leave it down in the description. This is a conversation. I answer a lot of my comments. And so you guys are free to talk amongst yourselves or to leave some comments down below. Let me know, was that movie dead on or dead wrong? Thank you so much for watching. Over here are some more base gear videos and down here are some ones that YouTube picked out just for you.